Hello? Hello. There we go. And you've been standing for a while. Why don't you stand real quick? I won't hold you long standing. Maybe stretch real big. Yawn if you need to yawn. Thank you. I, I like that. There we go. Y'all look fantastic tonight. Let's look to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. If you're watching, turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 if you're able. And looking forward to sharing the word of the Lord with you tonight. I'm going to endeavor to teach a principle to you that hopefully you can carry with you for the rest of your life. And I assure you, if you embrace the concept or the subject of tonight, it will make a big difference in your life. I can say that. I can't tell you if I'm going to do good or bad, but I can tell you if you embrace the subject of tonight, it will influence and impact your life. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, let's read together. For the word of God, come on, let me hear you, is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's awesome. That's spiritual surgery 101. You may be seated. I want to speak to you tonight from this subject, His Word, Our Assurance. Who was the greatest financier in the Bible. And we have some finance people in here tonight that are very well informed in the financial world. But I figured I would ask all of you, who is the greatest financier in the Bible? And I came to the conclusion it was Noah because he was floating his stock while everyone was in liquidation. All right, now that I'm used to student ministry, all right, now that we're settled in, I do have a, a, a serious question for you. What did God speak to you today? What did God speak to you today? There are many voices in the world in which we live, television, Radio, I think newspapers still exist somewhere. Social media, technology in the phone or a computer, or even in person there are voices that speak incessantly in our life. To some we give much attention and credence, to others marginal but for the most part, there are many voices that, that speak in our life. Even today, many voices have spoken. But what did God say to you today? The plethora of available word sources has created a massive distraction in relation to the word of God. And oftentimes, personally, if there isn't a discipline established... It is easy to not receive or to not hear or to not read the Word of God for today. But without question, each of us, every day of our life, need an infallible, inerrant, and an inspired Word of God. Only one source can satisfy the definition of those three, and that is the Bible, the Word of God, and of such there is no application in which the Word fails. I don't know of any other presentation in life that can bear that testimony. There is no application of the Word of God that fails. It has never failed and nor will it ever will fail. For the word of God is infallible, it is inerrant, and it is inspired. And his word 
is assembled within the boundaries of the Bible. Oftentimes it'll say the Holy Bible or the Holy Bible. If you have a Bible, would you pull it out and maybe see what the front page or the front cover says? Just capture what it says for a moment. You don't have to verbalize it. I do want all of you, if you have your Bible, to go ahead and pull it out. If it's on your phone, go ahead and pull out your phone. Uh, we will use it as an application at the end of tonight. If you don't have an app, a Bible app on your phone, you don't have a Bible, just quickly search. I'll give you permission to get on your phone and quickly search a Bible app and download a Bible on your phone. You need it on your phone. You need a, a physical Bible. And that's all the meddling I will do tonight. The Bible is the source of knowledge, or the Word of God is the source of knowledge for people of all kinds, of every tongue, of every kindred, every nation. And it is the object of attention and the object of knowledge that allows us the opportunity to be free. In order for us to be free, we must know the truth. And if we know the truth, there is a promise that we shall be set free. And it's interesting to me that God chose humanity to reveal His Word to His people. The First Testament documents the calling of prophets to speak to the nation of Israel. The Second Testament documents the eyewitness experiences of humanity's testimony of the Word. Despite their idiosyncrasies and personal perspectives, of which we all have, the writers of the Old and New Testament the prophets of the old and the eyewitnesses of the new bring to us a beautiful collection of the spoken word of God. Simon Peter, the disciple assigned with the keys to open the door of salvation, gave testimony of the holy inspiration. I'll paraphrase the first few verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. In this manner, and then you can study it later. We did not retell some masterfully crafted legend when we informed you of the power and appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we saw his magnificence and splendor unveiled before our eyes. We heard the voice of God while we were with him, and then I'll actually specifically reference 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, a familiar passage of Scripture, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, or that you pay attention, as unto a light that is strong. That shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. This book, this holy Bible, if you want to say it that way, or the word of God is a prophetic word. The good news. The good news. I'm sick of bad news. The good news that shines a piercing light in a gloomy darkness. Simon Peter was inspiring us. Then in a situation of gloomy darkness, go to the good news. It's a sure word. He continued on in verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved on. By the Holy Ghost. I love what author James Wallace had to say about the Bible. And you need to go do your due diligence on James Wallace and his story. But he said this, and I quote, it comes from his book, Cold Case Christianity. 
If we reject the entirety of Scripture or the Word of God simply because it contains artifacts of one kind or another, we had better be ready to reject the ancient writings of Plato, Herodotus, Euripides, Aristotle, and Homer as well. The manuscripts for these texts are far less numerous and they are far less reliable. From that I came to the conclusion the construct of all things in the world are supported by the Bible or are supported by the Word of God. And there seems to be attack recently as well as for all of time against the Word of God that has been given to us for our benefit and for our eternal relationship with Jesus. And so for the next few minutes, I want to capture your attention around the value of the infallible, inerrant Word of God. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. In the beginning, John said, John 1, 14. And the Word was made flesh. And what happened? It dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Accordingly, we arrive at this conclusion. God and His Word are directly associated. They cannot be separated. So let's look at the infallible portion of the Word of God. God is perfect as His revelation of Himself. I hope you brought your Bible so you can follow along or your, your phone so you've now downloaded the app so you can follow along. I'm teaching a lot of Scripture tonight. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, the infallible word of God, or the true word of God, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I have sent it. That's a true word of God. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my voice. It shall accomplish what I have sent it to do. Moving to the Testament of New, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. That by two immutable things, in which it was impossible. I'm not sure what they teach in school now. Thankfully, I don't have to go to school anymore. I love learning. I hated writing papers. <laughs> I didn't even much mind the test. I didn't do good that often, but at least it, it wasn't that long of, of a miserable experience. But papers were terrible. But when I was in school, I learned that impossible <laughs> is a pretty strong word that means it can't happen. And the writer of Hebrews said there's two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. In this we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. It is impossible for God to lie. Thus it is impossible if God and his word are directly associated, it is impossible for the word of God to lie. Therefore, we who have run to him are safe in his faithfulness. And this is where we find his strength and comfort, for he gives us the power to receive what has already been established in the beginning ahead of the limitations of time, an unshakable hope. To end all doubt and speculation, God had a purpose that was unchangeable. Two immutable things. Number one, he had a purpose that was unchangeable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He had a purpose for you that was unchangeable. 
So he gave us a vow, the writer says, or a promise. And in those two things, it is impossible for him to lie. God had a purpose that was unchangeable, so he added a vow of promise to his purpose. And by these two things, we have an unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God himself. Every adversity fails because of his purpose in our life joined with his word in our life. In response to Philip's concern or Philip's adversity about the word, Jesus aligned himself with the word. John 14 and 10, believe us not that I am in the Father and the Father in me. The Words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Philip, this is how I kind of imagine it. He kind of looked at Philip and said, Philip, if you can get this in your identity, the works that I do shall you do. And greater works than these shall you do. And if you ask in my name, or if you ask according to my word, I will do it. If you claim the word, God will reveal his perfect and divine purpose in your life because they are joined together. Too often we forget to join his purpose with his word and we don't live fulfilled. But if we can gain an attention to the word with an attention to his purpose, Jesus gave us promise that if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The reason the last month we've experienced miracles is because we have aligned his purpose with his word for our life. So that is the infallible word of God, which leads us to the inerrant word of God, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Somebody help me learn what profitable is real quick. What is profitable? It is profitable. It is good. It is beneficial. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteous. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. It explains it very simply to us that the Bible is inerrant for our benefit. Many have presented their case against the word without an experience of tasting. So if you go randomly do a Google search on the word of God, you're going to find all kind of reasons why the word isn't true or why it isn't full of errors or, or why it isn't inerrant. And the reason is many people haven't tasted and seen what is in the Bible. I came across... A great illustration today, and I just wanted to eat an apple, so I brought an apple tonight. And I have a question for you. Is the apple sweet or sour? Exactly. None of you know because you haven't tasted the apple. The Psalter gave it to us very clear in chapter 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see. Not that the apple is good, but that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. There's too many people walking around like they got a word, and they have never tasted and seen what the word is. <laughs> I'll make a promise to you, and I rarely do that. If you will get in this book, if you will taste, you will see what the blessing of the Lord has for your life. If you'll quit Googling what you're supposed to do tomorrow and go to the book, you'll get some instructions on what you're supposed to do tomorrow. The 
The world is frustrated because they've given up on the book. But when you get the word of God in your heart, when you know the word of God, how did Jesus win in Matthew 4? It is written, it is written, it is written. So we'll move hastily to the inspired or the voiced word of God or the word of God that is given to us through him. I love this quote from, in my opinion, one of the greatest presidents of the United States of America. It's on the screen and you can see it. Within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems men face. How about that from a sitting president of the United States of America? I tasted and seen and it's frustrating me. Within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems men face. God voiced it and men recorded it. It is absolutely trustworthy. It is the absolute authority of the inspiration that is written because it is God's word. It protects us against sin. It is the code to living in freedom, living in abundance, living without sin. It is full of energy. It is quick. It is powerful. It is sharp according to our text. It is the word of God that interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secret motives of our hearts. That one hurts. I'll say it again so you can capture it. It is the word of God that reveals and captures the true intent of your heart. It is the Word of God that is dynamic, supernatural, and eternal. And in Psalm 119.89, we learn that forever, O Lord, Thy Word is settled in heaven. We also know that heaven and earth will pass. But his word will not pass until all is fulfilled. I wanted to run around the campus today when I, when I read that scripture, Sister Mangan. Everything around me is going to pass. But if his word isn't fulfilled in my life, I don't have anything to worry about. And I did like a drop kick on the devil. What you get? The word of the Lord will not pass in my life until it is fulfilled in my life. Jesus, God in the flesh, the word in the beginning, the same yesterday, today, and forever, simply gives us an experience through these pages, that if we will somehow grasp, we too can have our own experience that will rival the stories in these pages if we will obey His Word as did those who compile the details of this Word. Because divine authority happens when we act on precedent. The word in the beginning is the same word at the end. It does not change. The word of God is alive and it is active in us. It is a precedent of truth. And it is a present supporter of truth. In this moment right now, the word of God is true. It wasn't just true yesterday as our precedent. It is true right now in this moment. precedent is we know because of an earlier event that is to be considered in a, a similar circumstance. So if you have precedent, 
an earlier event has happened in which you can draw a similar circumstance in which you can draw some type of reason. Even laws are determined, even judgments are determined on precedent. And it came across my thought process that precedent is merely promises, but you cannot claim promises you do not know. How can you move on a promise if you do not know it? So I wanted to run through some promises of God for your encouragement. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 talks about the presence of God. Here's a promise that will carry you in any situation. Is applicable in any situation, in any dark moment. As Peter documented in 2 Peter chapter 1, in a gloomy situation. This promise is for you, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou go. Thank you, God, for that promise. This is not specific to Joshua. Yes, I understand how it was written, when it was written, the context of which it was written, but it is applicable to us as well. It was written for our benefit. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It is profitable. It is for us. It's a promise for you. If you're watching, that's a promise for you. Here's a promise of His kindness and the covenant of God. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. Thank you, God. Go study a covenant of peace. It will not be removed from you. Says who? Says the Lord that has mercy on you. That's powerful. His kindness and His covenant will forever be with you. His power is with us. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Here's promises for you. What did the Word of God speak to you today? If you didn't feel like He had spoken anything to you today, here's some words of God for you for today. Tomorrow you have to get your own. God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power, of love, and a sound mind. What if you walked around tomorrow quoting that verse? I may do it myself. God has not given me a, a, a spirit of fear, but he's given me a, a, a spirit of power. He's given me a word of love. He's given me a word of a sound mind. Lord knows I need a sound mind in my life right now. you need a word of wisdom, James chapter 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. If you're concerned about your purpose in life, if you don't know what your purpose is, if you are questioning your purpose, there's a promise from God in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, that goes this way. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Your purpose in life is secure by Jeremiah 29 and 11. And then what is powerful about the promises of God is they all come to fruition. And we find that based on the precedent of Joshua chapter 21 verse 45. Please memorize this or highlight it and post it somewhere where you can see it for the next few days. There failed not Ought of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. What happened? All came to pass the word of God in your life. 
or the promises of God in your life are yea and amen, and not one word will fall to the ground in failure. Whatever God has spoken to you, you can believe on the precedent that has been established through his word that it will come to pass. I wish someone would receive that. I wish someone would embrace that. Because without question, God has spoken a word to people in here and there's been an assailment against your spirit, your soul, and your body. And there's a sure word for you tonight. His word, but it's your assurance that not one word that has been spoken to you will fail. And I feel a witness of the power and the presence of the Lord right now. Not one word will fail that God has spoken to you. So if God told you your family is going to be saved, go ahead and claim my family is going to be saved. If God gave you a sure word that you were going to be at a certain place in life, go ahead and write it down. You're going to be there. If God gave you a word that you were going to be healed, go ahead and believe and receive that it is going to happen. Not one word. But it all came to pass. That is the precedent that establishes the present in which we live, in which we see. The only way we know the present is because we live in it. It is visible to us or we see it. That is how we recognize the present. And John had a glimpse of the word in Revelation 19. He saw heaven opened. And suddenly a white horse appeared with a rider named Faithful and True. And this rider wore regal crowns of authority. And John saw his eyes that were as flames of fire. His eyes are a translation of the Greek phrase ophthalmal auto. Ophthalmal is the plural Greek word for eyes and from where we get the word ophthalmology. The word auto means of him. Used together the two words define a sense of wonder a sense of victory a sense of unmatched dominion meaning there was something different about the eyes of Jesus and John in his present moment came to the truth, and he says it this way, the eyes of him, which emphatically declares that Jesus' eyes were altogether unlike anyone else's John had ever looked into. Although John had looked into Jesus' eyes thousands of times, nearly 60 years earlier, this time, in his present moment, John sees something completely different. The precedent had been established, but now Jesus gives him a revelation of something of which he was even struggling to record. Revelation 19 and 13. This is what John saw. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called The Word of God. Perhaps John felt isolated. Perhaps John felt scarred. And perhaps John questioned his purpose as his age had only gotten older. And Jesus gives him a revelation in his present moment. John, I know you are isolated. John, I know you are afflicted. And John, I know your body is scarred. And John, I know you are old. And it may seem that your purpose is coming 
to an end. But John, I want you to look into my eyes and I want you to look at me differently than you've ever looked at me before. And when you look on me in a different way, you'll see that written on me is the Word of God. John, I am still the Word. And being that I am still the Word, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. In the Word was life, John. And John, you know that the Word of life gives light to all humanity. So John, I want you to see that I am still the infallible, the inerrant. And I want you to know that I am the inspired Word of God. And John, if you will fix your eyes on the Word, you will understand that I am the King of Kings. And you will know in this present that I am the Lord of Lords. Can we stand to our feet tonight? Our knowledge of His promises gives us precedent for the afflictions of our present. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, For the Word of God is quick and is powerful and is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Seemingly, the writer captured the imagery of the most efficient weapon of that time to emphasize his point. The word is a matchless weapon for our benefit. So I'm asking you tonight to use the word. Speak this word. Declare this word in your life. So here's the application and and this is where we will come to a conclusion. And then you can go home and have a word for tomorrow when you awaken. I want you to come to the front. And if you're watching, I want you to pause whatever other things you're doing. If you're driving, I'm going to be bold enough to ask you to pull over to the side of the road. It won't cost you an extra two minutes. Bring your Bible or bring your phone. Here's how we're going home tonight. I made the assumption that most of us have our own word, Brother Aubrey. Most of us have that go-to passage of Scripture. Most of us have that Scripture that we go to in most every situation in our life. I made that assumption. I heard someone quoting earlier what their Scripture was. I'll give you a few moments. If you're watching, giving you a few moments. I want you to open your Bible or I want you to open your device. So either physically in your Bible or your phone digitally. I want you to pull out your verse. That may be difficult. Some of you may have multiple verses. It's hard to say your favorite. I get it. I understand it. I've said it as well. Whatever it may be, and it's going to sound like chaos. Wherever you are, I hope you have it. It's going to sound like chaos here in a second. But this is the promise of God in your life. This is the word of God in your life. It's inerrant. It cannot fail. It cannot lose. Not one word. It's infallible. It's inspired. So hopefully you have your scripture. Maybe you can quote it. If you don't have your physical Bible or your digital Bible, maybe you can quote it. And I'm going to ask you to join in in with us. I'm I'm bantering back and forth between two right now for me. I'm going to choose Matthew 6.33 tonight. That's pretty much how I've lived my life. That's the foundation on on which I've lived. 
and supported everything of my life. So I'm going to quote that. Everybody has it. If you don't have your, your word, would you raise your hand? It is so important to me that you have your word. Here, I'm going to let you borrow my Bible so you can have a word for tonight. How's that sound? Yes, ma'am. I don't have another Bible, so you're going to have to look on one. I do, they're in my office, but you're going to have to look on. I can quote it. But. So here we go. On three, two, one, we're going to lift our voice to God. And we're going to repeat his promise that he's given to us back to him. And when we do that, I believe Joshua 21 and 45 is going to come to life in our life. That not one thing that he's told us will fail, but that all will come to pass. Everybody ready? Those of you that are watching, I hope you're ready. Three, two, one. Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Thank you, God, for the promise. Thank you, God, for your word. Now, why don't you lift your hands and lift your voice, or maybe give a praise unto God for the word that will not fail, for the word that will give life. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Piercing through the darkness comes a sure word or an assurance that everything in your life will be okay because of the word of God, the infallible word of God, the inerrant word of God, and the inspired word of God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you want to be baptized in Jesus' name, there's precedent for you to be baptized in Jesus' name. If you want to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, there's precedent to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Evidence speaking in His heavenly language. If you need us to pray with you, we'll pray with you. Those of you that are watching, if you have questions, please contact us. We'll pray with you until then. Your assignment is to find your word and claim it. Know that Sunday is a special day. Oh, that was a great word right there. That was a great word right there. And let me tell you what you need to do. You need to go home before you go to bed, sit down, stop for about 35, 40 minutes, watch the first half tonight, and then watch the other half more, and just keep watching that message. Let that word, don't let it be a one-time thing here. Go back and you get discouraged. Look at that word, preach that word, and leave that word. It's going to be something. Then don't forget Sunday morning. We're going to have revival here with Brother Heron. Amen? And the next Sunday, Pastor Gentry was preaching his communion, his communion service. And I asked Pastor, my pastor, if I could preach that Sunday. Because I feel like the Lord has spoken a word to me for this church. There's no way we can survive in this day and time if we're not full of the Holy Ghost. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So this Sunday, let's have church. The next Sunday's communion. And we're going to have a great time together. I love y'all. Greet one another, lady to lady, man to man. Get out of here.